I'm very happy uh, to welcome the panel. Um, I'll introduce them to you briefly, though you may know some of them. Graeme Finley is an old pal of mine, um, featured on my News Talk show, and is a <coughs> weekly guest on Sean Moncrief's show, still on News Talk. Are you still explaining the world? Yes, uh, whatever is the, the new event. slot now I get to show for it. It's called Tell Me Why, where hopefully people ask why questions, and then, then I... I answer them. Yeah, because, so it's about everything. So Graham <laughs> is from the um, School of Politics and International Relations in UCD and originally came from um, the Department of Philosophy in Trinity. So he brings that nice slant to it. And for anyone who doesn't know him, he's Canadian, not American, just for the purposes <laughs> of clarity. Um, oh, Seth, Seth Tillman is an American and um, he's lecturing in law in the um, Maynooth University. I think that's the new branding of Maynooth. They're, I think they're, Maynooth University. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, and you have um, clerked for several uh, judges in America, district court, and I think it up for the Court of Appeal as well. Yeah. So, um, so heavy on the law. Um, Shana Turner, you might not know, she's a recent addition to Dublin. She just moved here in August, originally from Texas, and she's a director of TASC, um, the think tank that focuses on economic inequality, and I'm sure you're all familiar um, with their work. And uh, you're in Princeton, isn't that right? She's in University of Chicago. So, uh, no, Cambridge. Oh, Cambridge. So, um, um, a first class academic background. And Thomas Byrne, uh, Fianna Fáil TD, first elected at uh, the tender age of 29. Um, he's their spokesperson on education and skills, but he's also, some of you may not know, a qualified attorney in the state of New York. Um, so, again, bringing a nice angle to us. And particularly when it comes to the topic of our session. I kind of groaned a little bit when I saw it. Uh, the future of US foreign relations, Ireland, Europe, and the world. And Dan told me the emphasis on future. Um, I was making a list of what might constitute the world that didn't con uh, comprise Ireland and the EU. I've got down Russia, North Korea, China, Iran, Yemen, the Middle East, potential second Arab Spring, and of course, general counterterrorism. But Dan wants me to finish by one o'clock, so we'll try and hit on as much of that as we can. Um, so for the opening um, statements from um, each of our panelists this morning, Graham, might you kick us off? Please? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I've been asked to talk about, yes, the effects on Europe and the world, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, the thing about the Trump presidency uh, is uh, it's got no coherent message, and it's the chaos at the center of the administration in terms of foreign policy, but also a lack of capacity. Trump has failed to appoint ambassadors to crucial roles like South Korea, uh, assistant secretaries. The entire <coughs> Department of State is facing a 30% reduction in its budget, and uh, this is one of the few things which Trump and Rex Tillerson agree about. Um, Rex Tillerson is trying to run the Department of State like a company. And this lack of capacity is leading to a massive lack of influence in the world. And this is leading to the, some of the kinds of reactions we're seeing today. Now, uh, one thing I was asked to think about is how resilient is the international system? Can it, can it cope with this kind of vacuum? And uh, another one is to see what maybe the future might hold. Uh, the international system has some resilience because in some of the cases, whether it's withdrawing from NAFTA right, or um, decertifying the Iran deal, the costs are going to largely be borne by the United States itself. You know, now, it's a, a suboptimal result for the US to scrap NAFTA, but at least Canada and Mexico have free trade deals with, say, Europe, which will allow them to have some residual benefits. Similarly, if the US reintroduces sanctions on, on Iran, um, Europe might profit from being able to trade with Iran under the Iran, Iran deal. So, Insofar, and of course, another reason it's resilient is that uh, leaders like Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron have seized it as an opportunity to, both for domestic political reasons and on the European level, seize a certain kind of leadership. Um, Macron is allowed to get, um, you know, Trump withdrew from UNESCO. Macron was able to get a French woman elected uh, president of UNESCO. Uh, uh, and Macron has allowed himself to be the savior of the Paris uh, Accord and so forth. But there's also uh, a lot of reasons to think that this will lead to increased securitization in the EU, which we're already seeing. Um, uh, ben Tonra told me, points out, or pointed out the other day, that uh, uh, VPHR Mogherini, who's quite hawkish in securitizing as a, as from the very beginning, has said that more has been achieved in terms of security cooperation in Europe over the last year than the last 10 years. And so, uh, and there are a lot of decisions in terms of cooperation which are going to be made at the end of this year. Uh, and uh, we'll see where people go. And crucial to this is the sense that, uh, again, the big players, France and Germany, 
are already engaging in more extensive bilateral cooperation and European cooperation, and they seem to have an appetite for more. Uh, and so for all those reasons, you might see a more robust EU, and you might see a more resilient and stable, well, you may see a resilient and stable international system. The one worry is where the costs aren't borne by the actors, but where there's an opportunity, you see the kinds of destabilization, and which is manifested in things like the seizure of Kirkuk by the Iraqi government, uh, where, if, where players like Saudi Arabia versus Qatar or, or uh, the Iraqi government versus the Kurds, uh, where they see an opportunity and there's no coherent or effective pressure from the United States, that's when you're going to see an unstable world. And so we have to look at each, every possible issue or conflict to see who's going to bear the costs and what are the benefits. Okay. Um, Seth Tillman. Well, um, thank you. I, I'd like to pick up with the, the very last comment from um, the last panel as sort of an introduction, where the last speaker said something along the lines, we have to think about the things we can do, like education and improving the economic system to help them. All right, if you want to understand what's going on in America today, focus on that statement, because about half of America hears statements like that, and they are irked. They're more than irked. They're mad as hell. The idea that there's this we who is going to help them misses the whole point. About half of America believes the country is already theirs, and they should make the decisions. So if you want to know what's guiding what some people in this room seems to think is anger or populism, it's the feeling that there are some people, like in this room, who seem to think that the country is theirs, and it's their job to figure out how to run it for other people. All right? Now, if you heard that statement and weren't 100% irked, then I would say you don't understand what's happening in America today. If you missed that, if you didn't fall on the floor laughing or crying, then you're not going to understand what's going on in America today. So let me follow up with the second statement. When Irish politicians come to America and they make certain statements in the United States, and they make those statements to help them in, American, in, in Irish politics, you're going to expect certain things. But when Irish politicians come to America and in the White House, like the prior Taoiseach, talk about the undocumented, about half of America takes exception. They don't consider them to be the undocumented. About half of America considers them to be illegal aliens. And that half of America is voting for what used to be called law and order. And if you don't see that, you're missing what's going on in America. I don't think it's about racism. I don't think it's about immigration, per se. America has always welcomed legal immigrants. All right? We had, I think it was this gentleman here a few moments ago, who spoke about America used to have a party that was called the Know Nothing Party. Well, that's wrong. <coughs> that's what their opponents called them. They called themselves, believe it or not, the American Party. And they were one of the factions that ultimately formed the Republican Party. All right? So it's very easy to simplify other people's history. All right? It's very easy to simplify other people's history. But the idea that this is a blip, or you should forget it, my guess is all the people in this room who are engaging in wishful thinking who think it's a blip were probably surprised by the Brexit vote. And I believe all the people who are saying it's a blip were probably surprised by the Trump vote. But that's the point. If you are continually surprised, maybe it's time to take a step back and realize you don't know what's going on and to consider an alternative that something new is going on, something very different. All right. Of course it has roots in America's past. Of course it does. All right. uh, but that doesn't mean it's rooted in everything you've been taught to hate. Uh, it's very easy to understand why people in West Virginia voted the way they did. Because the Democratic Party, its candidate, its prior candidate, the president, went to East Coast establishments and told them we're getting rid of coal because it threatens green, uh, our greenhouse goals. Well, that didn't go over well in West Virginia. Of course, the Democratic Party wasn't willing to assert that in West Virginia. Right? That takes me to the future. What do people with this worldview want America to do and expect in a future when you think along those lines? Well, the first thing that they think is that they do not see the world order as a place of fair play, a place where America gets a good shake. They think the international institutions are largely rigged against American values and American interests. I'll give you a good example. Look at the way the EU has treated VW and compare it to the way the EU has treated Google. One's getting away scot-free and one isn't. Well, Americans don't think they're getting a good deal from the EU, or at least about half of America feels that way. So America's reconsidering its position. 
It's going to reconsider how it treats other uh, organized trading blocs. It's going to reconsider its institutions of inter international governance. So, what can I tell you about Ireland? All right. Uh, <coughs> America doesn't want to be the slow-moving behemoth anymore that other countries optimize their policy around. All right. The Trump administration wants a better deal. My advice to you is you should try to get a better deal, you being you people who are of and from Ireland. You'll be respected in America for doing that, so that, at least that part of America that is the Trump administration. So here's a proposal for you. Here's the sort of proposal that you might like, but then again, you might not. It's entirely up to you. This isn't my country. It's your country. I sort of get irked when I hear a bunch of foreigners tell us we've chosen the wrong president. And that doesn't mean I voted for Trump. I just don't think it's a bunch of foreigners' business. Any more than most of you probably think it's my business to tell you to vote FF, FG, or Labour, or anyone else, you people who are of Ireland. Right now, you, you're going to have a problem with your border with up north, aren't you? You're going to have a problem with Brexit. All right? You're going to have to very much consider what your policies will be. All right? You probably can't control that so much because EU policy mandates that there has to be an external tariff. But EU policy and EU law doesn't mandate your corporate rate. So here's, here's a policy. Some of you will like it. Some of you will consider it to be a joke. Lower your corporate rate to 1% and go to the Americans and say, we're going to lower our taxes before you, and we're going to lower our taxes more than you do, and we want to keep American enterprise and joint ventures with America here in Ireland. Compete. Show them, I know this is an unpopular way of putting it, but it used to mean something. Show them your men. Thank you. Um, Shana. The first is that I don't know if Ireland is going to have that kind of freedom in the future because I think increasingly its future will be locked in with the EU and there'll be the, cor the consolidated corporate tax base um, <coughs> argument. But more importantly, I think you've mentioned Brexit and I didn't hear that in the last panel. And I've, I've just come from the UK and I'm, I'm also a British citizen. So for me, what's happened with Trump and what happened with Brexit are very similar. I don't think that you can extract the US. You, there's certain things that are, that are pertain to the U.S. and the U.S. only, and I'm saying that because I'm also from Texas, and I know that in my brother's neighborhood in Dallas, everybody voted for Trump, but they didn't vote for him because of, they might have voted because of the illegal alien argument, but most of their cleaning people, the people that do the yards, they're not documented, and so they rely upon a cheap labor force. I wouldn't say that that's a strong argument. <coughs> they voted for Trump because of their taxes. They voted because they want to keep their guns. Almost everybody in my brother's neighborhood in Dallas is open carry, and if you go to places like Austin, where um, the University of Texas, you'll see signs on the faculty's door, please don't bring your gun into um, office hours. So they have died. <laughs> I can see the horror in your face. So they, there's, a cultural, there, there's, a, there's a cultural trend, and they think that Trump is going to protect that. But they're not anywhere, they're as far from the people in West Virginia as you can get. West Virginia, the people in West, West Virginia may have voted for Trump for economic reasons because they feel like nobody else is listening to him. And if you listen to Trump on the trail, and I, I'm from a progressive think tank, I would have said, wow, you know, yeah, take care of the people who've been left behind. But they're not the people who voted for him in my brother's neighborhood. They voted because they want to keep their income. So, but what brings me to my, my sort of wider point, I've come from the UK, and I've worked for the past 14 years in neighborhoods where they voted for Brexit. You know, and you're thinking, you're losing EU funding. I went to Cornwall. You know, Cornwall voted for Brexit, and it's one of the lowest income areas. You know, they need EU funding, just like Wales needs EU funding, but Wales voted for Brexit. And I see the same trends, and it's the decline of an economic model, but there's no alternative. And so they voted for what they saw as a protest vote. And I don't see Trump, I mean, I don't see him as a blip, but I see him as part of a larger phenomenon. I see that he came at a good time, it was fortuitous, he was lucky, and he represented something. He also didn't get the popular vote in the U.S., and I don't know that he's got lasting power, not, a, not just because of popular support, but also I think he's got too many scandals. But th if you look at Brexit and you look at Trump, I think the main issue is what's going on politically in terms of the divisions, because we also haven't talked about the response to Trump, which I think is a, galvan a galvanized op opposition that you can see in the Labour Party. I think if you see the transformation of the Labour Party over the past year, from Jeremy Corbyn the loser to Jeremy Corbyn the upcoming Prime Minister, and Keir Starmer looks like the grown-up in the room with Brexit negotiations, I think you see a trend toward the left getting it together. And I'm not saying that only because I'm the director of a progressive think tank, but also because I think that the left is being forced to think about new ideas and new allies. Now, I also, I've, I've recently done some work for the World Bank in Morocco, 
in the World Bank, in the OECD, in the IMF, are actually on that we have to do something about inequality. And all this political instability is bad for the global market. But they're saying things very similar to what you will see progressives say. And so I think what we are going to see in the future, which is what I was asked to talk about, is the kind of Trump, Xi, Putin type politics. I'm, I'm an increasingly authoritarian, or I am an authoritarian figure, and my party can you know, go to hell. I don't care about my party, which is what Trump is saying to his own party. And a mobilized, progressive alliance between different actors, institutions, activists, and political, political parties. It may not happen immediately, but I think by the time we rolled around to the 2020 presidential election, or even the next British election, you're going to see an indication of where the fault lines are. But they won't be national, they'll be transnational. Okay. Thomas. Thanks very much. And I suppose I came up with a few ideas that I, I wanted to sort of share. Seth has touched on one of them. And that is, I think that we spend too much time in this country um, talking about internal US politics and items that really have no impact whatsoever on us. Um, maybe Obamacare or watching the news last night, and some senator was criticizing Trump. And it was very high up in the news, actually, on, on the 6-1 of the 9 o'clock news. And I was a bit surprised about that. Um, and I think that we, you know, I've personally a huge interest in it. I, I'll certainly follow it. But I, I, as a politician, I don't, think, I don't think I've ever made a statement or Twitter or anything about what's going on, or even the election when I was, I was over at the convention. I gave an interview about it subsequently. I said, you know, I like the Democrats and all that, but we really, really should stay out of it. And I think that as regards the internal side of American politics, I think we as Irish politicians really need to stay, stay the hell away because I think, I think Seth's point is right, actually, that they, they really do react, I think, in a, and rightly, I think, in a negative way. I mean, there are issues there. I mean, we all probably think gun, the gun issue is absolutely crazy, and I think objectively is, but that people don't see it. You know, intelligent people in the States don't see it like that. And I think we've got to have some understanding for that and for the different cultural issues uh, that, are, that are there. And I think we often don't show that understanding. And I think on some issues in the last year, there was a lot of grandstanding by Irish politicians about issues that really they had no, uh, no role whatsoever in and should have no interest whatsoever in rather than concentrating uh, on our own issues. That said, there are issues um, in U.S. affairs that are of consequence to Ireland, and I think it's really, really important, I don't agree with Seth on this, that it's really, really important that we do get involved uh, to the greatest extent possible to protect our own interests here. And I'm thinking of issues like the undocumented, I think it's absolutely, absolutely legitimate for any Irish government or any Irish politician to advocate on behalf of our citizens in other countries, including uh, those in America who are, certainly are illegal, uh, but are in, are in difficult spots, and that we would advocate on their behalf, and other countries do the same, and I think it would be negligent of us not to get involved in an issue like that. The same, the tax bill is coming up now um, for a hearing in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, and Trump has his own tax plan. And there are obviously issues there that affect us, and I think that we should be, uh, uh, to the extent that we can, lobbying in relation to that. And on that, in relation to lobbying, I see um, uh, former Ambassador Anderson is here, and, and certainly was a great uh, guide for us at the Democratic Convention last year. And there's huge links, obviously, at, at official level, uh, between officials and officials, and. Ambassador Anderson and her team would have had huge contacts. But what I notice at the political level is that there are certainly huge contacts between Irish politicians and Democratic politicians and Democratic, the Democratic Party. And a lot of people know a lot of people, and, and we, we were invited to a Democratic uh, event uh, last year. But it seemed to me that there was next to no connection at a political level uh, between Irish politicians and the Republican Party and Republican politicians. And to me, this is a huge deficit. And when I went to the Dem Democratic Convention last year on behalf of Fianna Fáil, and there were representatives of other parties there too, I asked our General Secretary, I said, Sean, have we anyone going to the Republicans? He says, no, he says, they never invite us. But there, there really are no links. And it, it, it wasn't that we, we didn't want to go, or that we don't like the Republicans, or that we prefer the Democrats. It's just simply, this is just built up over the years. And I think, I suppose, Irish people, I suppose, maybe even before JFK, but there's, there's that cultural link, probably because of Kennedy, uh, with the Democratic Party and Bill Clinton's strong connection with us here as well, and thereafter Obama too. Uh, there's a strong cultural connection, but I think at the political level, if we want to start you know, getting more influence as, as, as things change, um, we, need to get, we need to establish greater links with the Republican Party at the political level, and that, that's a major deficit that I see at the moment. But we, we have great officials who have the connections and are working on the various issues, and I think it's absolutely within our right to do that, and we really need to do that. Um, 
I don't know how far we go because certainly there are reports of some countries who block book bedrooms in the, <coughs> the Trump Hotel in, in DC. I don't, I don't doubt we've done that, <laughs> but maybe we should be. I don't know. Is that the way to, the way to get it? Certainly, Can some you countries. imagine the reaction of the press if we I, did? I, I, look, I'm in opposition. I'd probably react the same way <laughs> yeah. that you anticipate. But, uh, <laughs> but some countries are doing it. So to that extent, there is lobbying going on by countries there in terms of their interests in what's happening in American politics and how it affects them. And I think we need to be right at the centre of that. And our embassy team are there's no question, um, but I think at a broader level we need to do that where it affects us. I think we're, we're too much time in things that don't affect us. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, the Irish government lobbying the United States government. What, what I said, to be clear, when the Irish government goes to the United States and in a public forum, right in the White House, calls these people the undocumented, that's done for your domestic audience. That's going to alienate about half of America, because to half of America, they're illegal. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't lobby for them, but if you do it right there in the White House and you use a language that is sticking in the thumb in the American eye, or at least half the American eye, then you're not really lobbying for your country. You're doing just the opposite. You're alienating a big chunk of America. So I'm not telling the people of Ireland they shouldn't try to affect American politics where you have legitimate interests. What I'm saying is when you do it, if you really are pursuing those interests and not a domestic audience, keep in mind Americans view their own politics in a particular way. And if you are so focused on how you view the world without sensitivity to how they might, or I might add half my countrymen, you're not going to be very effective at lobbying for Irish interests. As far as going to an event at the Republican convention, I'm not at all surprised they didn't invite Irish politicians. I'd be surprised if they invited any foreign politicians. The Republican Nigel Farage and, is there. And, 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 and I don't know why that should be a surprise. The Republican convention is there to pick the American president. People might ask the question, why are foreigners there? Um, Thomas, I'll stick with you on that point for a minute, and then I want to go to Shana on the tax. Um, you know, I was surprised by the extent to which, you know, the Irish political establishment has spent, certainly the last 20 to 30 years, crawling over each other, you know, to get to the Democrats, and in particular the Clintons. Whereas I knew, say, my mother's relations who'd emigrated from Cavan in the 20s, 30s, and 40s were all fundamentalist Republicans, pro-life, racist, and hated Obama. There is a big Irish Republican constituency there that we did neglect. And you really saw it when Kenny went over on St. Patrick's Day and was surrounded by Paul Ryan, Bannon. Trump spent the whole day with them. Um, I spoke to a diplomat who said they were amazed that, at the degree of attention that we got. How do we turn that to our advantage, or was it just playing for the crowd on the day? No, I, I think we need to work on it, because even Mike Mulvaney, yeah. the budget chief, I mean, it's yeah. very close Irish connections, and we, I know my colleague, Brennan Smith, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, has been over with and met some of these people. I think we need to do more of that. Yeah. My own aunt in, in suburban St. Louis would, would never vote for Clinton. Like, yeah. Absolutely never vote for Clinton. It would be the worst thing she could possibly imagine. She'd consider it a sin, actually. Yeah. 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 And, you know, that's, a lot of people think like that. And, yeah. and she's... You know, my other aunt is a Democrat up in Seattle, but she's yeah. uh, for different reasons. But it, 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 is, it, it was extraordinary to me as I realised this over the years that they wouldn't vote for the Democrats. Yeah. So I think we've got to get that understanding there and build up those connections. And those connections were certainly available on St. Patrick's Day, and I think there's absolutely no doubt that they, they, they shouldn't be <coughs> developed on at the political level. As I said, I think at official level, it worked, and that, the official, that's organised officially, the Paddy's Day celebration, so that, that, that's there. Com compliment our, our teams and foreign affairs and, and embassies and that, but politically, I think we need to do a lot more work because those personal relationships are really, really important. And look at our Ordesh last week. I mean, there were representatives of parties from all over Europe at, at that Ordesh, and no, no American reps, as far as I know. Um, but I think it's very important that parties kind of develop relations because I think it can be very, very useful then, at, again, when if the party gets into government, that there are personal relationships there. I think they can be helpful to a country. And I think that we have certainly spent quite a bit of time between the fall in the Alley group since we joined it in the, in the last, I don't know, six or seven years, developing really, really good relations that are... Sorry, the what group? The Alde group, the Liberal Democrat group in Europe. Oh, so yeah. um, um, we, we, that's, that's where we are. And, you know, I think to our benefit and probably hopefully to the country's benefit, that, that helps Fine Gael and the EPP, Labour and the Socialists. But I think that also in the States too, I think, I think the relationships, look, was very important to surround yourself with the Clintons. 
you know, when yeah. President Clinton was president and Hillary Clinton was in the Senate, that was very important to make those connections. But those connections have not been made to the same extent on the Republican side. I think that's up to us to do. Okay, so Shana, the big issue really for Ireland versus America is the tax. You know, this is what's concentrating minds heavily. Now, I was at a presentation recently um, by Fergal O'Rourke um, from PwC and from the OEDC or OECD. And they were very upbeat about the, pro the BEPS program and the progress that this is making in getting all that stateless money onshored. And we saw it with this big blip in our GDP figures, the 26%, which was evidence of BEPS working, that this money was coming onshore. And they were making the point that the, the, the political system in the states is so paralyzed, they can't reform their tax system to take advantage of the onshoring, and they may actually get left behind because of their own domestic inability to act. Is that your analysis of what's happening? Well, yeah, you can see just the, yeah. the plan for tax reform right now, that it's yeah. Trump's come out with it, and then automatically the critiques that it's only favoring the top 1%, and that, mm -hmm. so there's a debate about whether or not to tax those who earn more than a million dollars or if you're going to end up taxing heavily the middle class, which is his base, right? So he doesn't want to alienate his base. I, d I think that's completely correct. Until the political system um, in the U.S. is less stagnant, is less mired in the two-party politics. And what won't. about Seth's suggestion, you know, um, and okay, fine, Graham was suggesting, look, the EU is solidifying in many ways in the core, despite, you know, the instability in the periphery and Brexit. But is there, Practically speaking, a uh, possibility of having bilateral negotiations with America on tax, or are we obliged to stick with the OECD <coughs> and move on that track along with everyone else? My feeling uh, would be that there's more pressure to stick with the EU and yeah. the OECD because the U.S. is so unpredictable and is so weighed down by domestic politics. It's to totally, I mean, there's no stability in it, so you wouldn't want to anchor yourself in something. I think it's more profitable for Ireland to look to the state level. I mean, California is the sixth biggest economy okay. in the world. It's way up there in fighting climate change. Very innovative. And it's a democratic state, so you already have the relationship. So um, it's, uh, I would think it's more profitable for a country like Ireland to look at the different states and where they're going. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's also a, a, a model of, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this, but California, because once upon a time, it was very difficult to raise taxes yeah. in California. But it's a Case place where they raise taxes uh, under the incredibly still extant Jerry Brown, no, no. <laughs> um, and and so in a way it is showing the United States of how to do things differently. And what you, but what you're getting is is a real divide between states like California mm -hmm. and Massachusetts and states like Mississippi and Alabama, and to some extent the sort of breakdown of strong federal action. If you're if you're a, practically a California separatist, you could maybe even cheer it on. It's like, well, my state's okay, and what is with all these federal transfers to places yeah. like Alabama and Mississippi, right? So there is a lot of, there's a complex game being played at the state and federal level, I think. But even at the federal level, if you're thinking about cutting taxes, they can do it under budget rec reconciliation, <laughs> but will they do it? And I think there's a lot of reasons to think they won't. Um, yes, they might, if, they, if the Republicans have had a great success in cutting taxes for the very, very wealthy and saying they're giving the middle class a tax cut. They've done that in the past, they can do that now. Reducing the corporate tax rate from 35 to 20% is a big ask. And we know that Republican senators um, have looked at the cuts which would be required to balance the budget and are just aghast, right? And some of them are aghast because it involves cutting things which are basic to American life. But some of it are they're aghast because it involves cuts to their state, right? And so the Republicans have historically wanted to compete on corporate tax. Um, and that's what Paul Ryan said in a really interesting interview with the Irish Times. But and the Democrats have, have not, according to Paul Ryan, but the Republicans have never wanted to make the cuts, the real cuts, especially to defense, but also to their own home states, which balancing the budget, and that's why budgets balloon under Republican administrations. So, going so back, I don't think they're gonna do it. Okay, so going back to that point, in terms of, say, our foreign relations and how we're going to deal with America, do you see there's any point in having any kind of bilateral talks with the federal government, or do we stick with the OECD and, and that project? Well, we have to have bilateral talks yeah. with, the, with the US yeah. federal government. I mean, it's the, yeah. the biggest player, right? Yeah. But at the same time, no, I mean, we stick with the OECD because it comes out best for us, right? Yeah. You know, um, it's the way we can seem to be seen to be on board in global tax reform without giving up our tax rate or involving greater coordination within Europe. Uh, and so that's, that's quite strategic, uh, I think, on the Irish part. 
Uh, so yeah, we have no, I mean, we have no choice but to go with the OECD. And I think that will probably put some, I mean, I think the U US as a big system, which is hard to turn around, is still engaged with the OECD process and probably still will be after, I mean, I, I yeah. like other people's sense of this, but even once Trump's gone, which will eventually be gone, right? <laughs> Four more years. We should also engage with the states a lot more because the individual states now and is that have practical? a special role. As a, as a nation, we can uh, negotiate directly with the states. Well, I'll defer yeah. to former ambassadors uh, <laughs> about whether we have the diplomatic capacity to engage in the kind of serious relations to it with, with individual states. But uh, you know, I'm sure the politicians would be willing to. Yeah, well, I just, uh, just even at, the, at a very, very local level, I mean, I know, say, County Mead has twinned with Kerry, which is a fairly new city in North Carolina, and there's been huge links there. Last year, the Pennsylvania business secretary, I can't remember his name, he came over with a huge delegation from Pennsylvania. I think they toured Ireland, actually, yeah. uh, in general. But they spent Were they looking time. for ideas? Yeah, and uh, how things could, um, how we could share ideas. And there were Irish businessmen who were involved in, 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 in Pennsylvania were there and, and who were trying to bring things, join things up. But the point is, there was dialogue going on at a local level, at a, you know, local to local and local to state. And I think that, that can happen regardless of who's in power at the federal level. That's just normal. Uh, good relations and, and, and Canada is those already can be developed. engaging with the states much, much more um, because they just don't have a coherent correspondent at, at federal level. So, Seth, you know, I know you were making the point at the start. You know, there's a, a lot of stuff that's just none of our business. I don't think I yeah. quite said that. Yeah. I, 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 I think that when we have background conversations or off the cuff remarks like, well, Trump won't be there forever, and most of the audience laughs, you could imagine how. Even an American who's not committed to Trump might, you know what, maybe that's just not part of the crowd I want to be with. Okay, but exactly. Yeah, but on that. I mean, he's yeah. got to go sometime. So, so, but, yeah. so, but on that. We'll, we'll talk about the Prime Minister okay. Canada in those terms sometime, too. Okay, so, yeah. but on that, uh, uh, going forward, I can't believe I said that. It's gotten into my brain as one of those earworms. If we're looking at the future and we're looking at U.S. foreign relations, and we're looking at a president and an administration that is disdaining uh, global institutions that have enabled a lot of progress. How do you think that chaos is going to impact on America itself, apart from us? Because it looks to me like they're doing well, I think most of you uh, probably went to bed the night of the Brexit vote, expecting you knew, knew what the result would be when you woke up the next day. And I expect that most of you went, went to bed on the election night as president of the United States, you knew who was going to be elected, and then you had a surprise, unless you stayed up all night, right? right? The world isn't always what we expect. And when I, I get a question like the one you just asked me, really what you're asking me is my best guess about the future. All right, well, my best guess about the future, if I have to guess, it's going to be like the immediate past, because that's the best I could do. But that's the wrong way to look at it. The future is frequently unlike the past, and you should be thinking about solutions for problems where the future is different from the past. The EU is here today. Will it be around tomorrow and in a configuration much like it's in now? Probably, but maybe not. Are you planning for that? The Eurozone is here today, and so is the Euro. And it'll probably be around in the future, in a, something like what we have today, but maybe it won't. Are you planning for that? Are you ready to make your own currency again if you have to in a lurch? Are you ready to have bilateral relations with the chaotic United States? It doesn't matter if it's chaotic. It's there. It's big, and you have to deal with it. Sorry, the fact that, that you don't like it, be ready to deal with know, it. The speculation, that really, which is not based on anything, that the EU might be around or the euro might be around can equally be applied to the United States, uh, presumably. Be, absolutely. So okay. like, and, 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 and responsible ministers should plan for things like that. I'm not suggesting... But I'm saying that there's no point really talking about that at the moment. The EU is there. I think, we, you know, we're, as a nation, we're committed to it. We're, we're, our main focus is trying to maintain it and maintain our membership I, it, of it. That's amazing coming from a, a member of a parliament who is about to get a hard border imposed upon them by EU institutions. I mean, what are the tragedies of the press here in Ireland for the last couple of months since the Brexit vote? is the press, and uh, not just the press, but ministers of the Irish government are constantly in the news saying, how will the British solve the problem of the hard border? How will the British solve it? It's not the British who are going to be putting up the hard border. It's going to be your government following EU regulations that are imposed upon you by EU law. It's sh <laughs> okay, do you want to tell us your name and to have you a point to make? Would you like to make a point? My name is William Scott, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that it's, 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 a, it's a very adversarial position to say that the EU are imposing a hard border. Come on. The British decided to leave something. 
But we let him make his point. That, yeah. that, that, that is, is a sort of a, a legalistic adversarial view of, of a, a negotiation. Which you are choosing to make to make another point. Is is it not a pragmatic view though? You know, we can all complain about the British forever, and yet it is a situation we do have to deal with. Of course, you, know, you, you can't have a resolution of the three, three EU uh, the issues of citizens' rights, the budget, and Northern Ireland, without discussing trade and customs and all. They, in, in the end of the day, all that is going to be linked. What, what I'm sort of taking issue with, and I do agree with our friend on one or two other things at a time later, it is uh, that, that that is a sort of a legalistic adversarial view. The EU is wrong. I didn't say it, that. It, I it, said it's a political policy. No, we are a, 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 a member of a political institution, right? The UK are choosing to leave it. That is the framework inside which this has been discussed. You're right. It's adversarial. And let me tell you, I think there are at least a few people in this room who never heard that point of view, and I'm glad they heard it today. That's the, that, 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 that's the first point. The second point is, as a factual matter, if tariffs are collected, Ireland will be mandated to collect them by e-law. If they're collected, and Ireland doesn't appear to be getting any derogation. When the you, German and French banks needed Ireland to pony up money with no write-off, Ireland did. When the German and French banks needed to be protected against a sovereign bailout in Greece, they derogated from EU treaty law. But no one's talking about a derogation from Ireland for the hard border up north. Ireland just has to accept that this is imposed upon them. Actually, actually, do you mind if maybe if I pull it back a little bit to the world, okay? <laughs> just, uh, just to move things on because our, we, we still have to finish at one. Graham, one side effect of an isolationist attitude is that when America withdraws from certain regions, other actors enter. So, for example, we've discussed this often before in relation to Syria and the Middle East, that when solutions were being talked about, America simply wasn't being mentioned, or they were the last on the table, because people were talking about Russia, they were talking about the Kurds, the Saudis. Um, what do you see as the regions where the most severe knock-on effects might be from either an isolationist America or an incoherent American foreign policy? That's a very good question. He said stalling for time. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I, and I'm on two minds about so many yeah. of, of these, uh, these questions, so uh, I'll just throw a, a bunch of them. So the whole controversies, territorial controversies in the South and East China Sea, which is very much <coughs> used by Xi Jinping to gin up his base whenever he needs it. Um, the US, I mean, could be a potentially, a, a US withdrawal well, it certainly gives China a freer hand, but it might also de-escalate things, even if the U.S. is technically supposed to protect the Philippines and Japan in case of attack, right? Now, I don't think China, I mean, China is a rational actor. We had a wonderful speaker uh, at UCD mm -hmm. who said that China is, China's biggest problem is stupid foreigners. You know, like, they expect people to behave rationally and disciplined, in a disciplined manner, right? And, and then, you know, a, a state will throw its financial services uh, industry off a cliff, right? Uh, so that's their biggest problem. People aren't as disciplined and, and, and rational as the Chinese government. Anyway, um, so I think that's, a, that's an area, I mean, so North Korea obviously is yeah. already working this, this withdrawal of American influence and power fairly effectively. Um, and, and that's probably much more of a worry than, than the, the South and East China Sea. Um, I think if we look at sub-Saharan Africa, we have all these crises, Central African Republic, Burundi, and so forth. People aren't really talking about them a lot. Um, and the US has interests in there, but it's, it's taking its gaze off it. We all have taken our gaze off it. And there, I think, we're, we're not seeing the system work particularly well. Burundi continues to labor on with horrendous violence and massive refugee crisis and so forth. South Sudan, same thing. Um, so there is a place where we'll see things less stable. In Northern Africa, the, it's, I mean, this is just my own hobby horse, the EU is actually playing much more significant a role in terms of basically engaging in development and security with the sole goal, one's almost tempted to say, of keeping migrants as far from Europe as possible. Mm. And, and, and there, again, you know, probably most of us were unaware about America's you know, actions in Niger until someone got killed and it became a tweet storm, you know, which is not the way we should probably be looking at it. So there, I think the EU is much more of a player, and it's actually leading to a more coherent situation. Uh, I think the final 
area. Was, what about Iran? Do. So one of the problems, well, Iran, I mean, Iran can actually do maybe better out of um, the decertification of the deal. Because again, if the EU and France and Germany and Russia are still in place, then they can big up their relations with yeah. them and yet continue to sell the great Satan story to their own people, right? But no, I'm thinking one problem is, is peace in all these regions, but maybe especially in Syria. I mean, depending on how you feel about the, what's called the new interventionism. Um, the new interventionism is a process by which friends of the Secretary General, um, which actually turned out to be very powerful states, uh, protect you know, the interests in, of, of all of the conflicting parties. They tried it in Cambodia, and even the Khmer Rouge had a backer in, in China, even if it didn't really work out. Right? This process needs powerful and engaged states, and of course the most potentially powerful engaged state to help broker a solution by backing one of the factions is the United States. And so there's a way, an area where you could see failure to make progress. Shana, would you address that as well? Um, how US foreign policy, isolationist in rhetoric, you know, for the most part, and yet these occasional inconsistent interventions, how that affects the world, and which of those regions would you see as the biggest risk that we should be watching that might affect us? Um, I think North Korea is, might be the biggest risk, and since you have two very unstable um, mm, or unpredictable leaders. Yeah. But I, I think that the situation in terms of foreign policy for the U.S. is evolving because you have the State Department, which is understaffed, but has, like Tillerson is saying one thing, and he's trying to develop a, a foreign policy. If you look at his recent speech about India, democratic values, open markets. And so, and then Trump might say something else, but I, I don't know if the dynamic is going to increasingly be Trump will say something, he'll tweet something, but the policy is actually resting in the institutions and the leaders of the institutions. And I, I'm wondering over the next year, particularly in preparation for the 2018 congressional elections, there'll be more focus on the different, like the State Department or um, uh, John Kelly will have more control and they'll try to have more stability in the individual leaders, mm -hmm. who, some of whom have commercial backgrounds, some of whom have military background. Do you see Rex Tillerson lasting? Um, I see him under a lot of pressure to last. Um, oh. So that's what I think is going to be the biggest thing. Because you have, like, yesterday, Jeff Flake. I think the reason he was so up in the news is because he gave another powerful speech following on McCain's speech. Yeah. So McCain's not going to last because he's sick and he's 81 and he's, and he's you know, he's yeah. at the end of his. But so the, those, there's going to be a lot of pressure on stable, moderate Republicans. But I was worried about that Croker and Flake um, development over the last few days because I thought, fine, maybe these are the remaining elements of sanity in the Republican Party, but they're leaving. Like yeah. they're saying what they're saying because they're on their way out the door. Right. And Flake was going to lose that nomination um, in Arizona. So does that mean that even though there is this resistance from apparently moderate people, it's actually the sting of the dying wasp? And that, you know, the radicalism of the Republican right is, is going full steam ahead. This is the new normal. Um, I don't I would say it's a new normal. I think that they will be become more organized. If you look at Steve Bannon's political trajectory, he's definitely yeah. developing a strategy for the 2018 elections. Right. Um, so I, I do think he's, that a lot of the nominees in the primaries are going to be his nominees. Right. I definitely, definitely think that. But that puts still more pressure on the cabinet to stay in place from the Republican establishment. And even though you have the Koch brothers, yeah. well, they're ambivalent. So the, the money is behind... It's the money still a lot of the money is behind the establishment. Okay. I better throw it open. Yes, sir. If you tell us your name, please. Uh, yeah. Thomas Sorirton, uh, yeah. former member of the European Economic and Social Committee. If I, I, I agree with Thomas about not interfering in American politics. If I were an, Ameri an American, uh, I'd have voted for Hillary as the lesser evil in terms of internal mm -hmm. uh, policies. But I must say, I heaved a sigh of relief when she didn't win the election. Why? Because uh, I think we were threatened with what Lord George uh, once threatened Ireland with if we, if we didn't have our own civil war, immediate and terrible war. Mm -hmm. Hillary was pushing for an, an immediate confrontation with Russia in, 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 in Syria. Uh, now, with North Korea, we're perhaps threatened with intermediate <laughs> and terrible war. There's some distance established. But I think Europe needs to learn uh, from the mistakes of being so closely uh, allied with an American perspective for Europe which believed in drag not Gustin, expand, 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 mm -hmm. bring in Turkey and uh, uh, destabilize the Ukraine. And I witnessed President Barossa stoking that, that, the fires of that war in Ukraine. Let us remember that 
the, the idea of America participating in the world and uh, inducing uh, regime change uh, and Hillary Clinton uh, gloating became, we saw he died when Gaddafi was uh, sodomized to death. The result of that regime change is that Europe had to cope with the Mediterranean being one mass cemetery. And there is now the opportunity uh, with Germany learning the lesson that we're not going to pursue the American uh, fiction that uh, Crimea should be Ukrainian rather than Russian when it was always more Russian. Is there a, uh, does the panel see Europe getting its act together, deepening its own ties, and becoming a player in its own right, rather than looking across the Atlantic? Yeah, that's a great question. And maybe, Thomas, if you wouldn't mind referring to as well, is states like Latvia, where they're feeling very threatened by Putin aggression, you know, on that border, which, because he's being emboldened, you know, by the instability in NATO. Um, and, you know, he tests and he pushes. You know, we could have an EU state which might see a Russian invasion. And I know that's how they feel in those countries. Yeah, I was just wondering when the conversation would come around yeah. to, to Russia being there. And I yeah. don't necessarily see Russia as the evil empire, but there's no doubt that Russia seems to be getting very actively involved in a lot of issues, which I would be, if, if they were listening to me in this panel, they'd be saying, oh, that's somebody else's internal affairs. Um, they certainly have had a hand in the US election, that seems to be the case. They certainly appear to have been connected to Brexit as well in some ways. They, Certainly, a, a high up Russian bank lent money to Marine Le Pen. Their media get very excited when uh, Catalonia decides to vote one way. They seem to, there seems to be an interest there in Russia. Yeah, who destabilized the Ukraine? Well, what I want to say mm. is there seems to be an interest in Russia in, in upsetting the order, to, and they're entitled to advance their own interests. Who upset the order? I, I, I know what you're getting at, you know, and there's a very strong um, argument. You know, the NATO and the EU, you know, were. You know, we're needling away there. At, you know, at yeah. uh, Russian well, power. I mean, Listener look. said only the EU could turn trade negotiations into a crisis. Um, <laughs> Seth, do you want in on that? Who bombed Libya? I mean, why did Libya become a, a, a basically a stateless anarchic zone? This is one that ate on us. That speaking for the United States, mm -hmm. uh, the United States didn't bomb Libya into non-existence. It was England and France. Of course, Obama didn't stop them, but it was England and France. And I'm not going to blame it on the whole EU, but it wasn't as if EU institutions tried to close this bombing down. And that led to the Great Migration. But however you feel about that, that's a separate issue. All right. So yeah, the United States has certainly intervened all around the world in all sorts of places, sometimes to good ends, sometimes to less good ends. But this EU state of deeper integration uh, <clears throat> might not bring more stability. It, look what's been done to date and ask yourself, is there a wide enough agreement that if you have the EU super state with an EU army and an EU foreign policy, are you going to get more stability because you'll have this big army to start using? Maybe you will, but that's a prediction. Well, none of us could really know the answer to that. Graham, I'd be interested in your thoughts there on the EU. I mean, you did refer to, you know, we can, I say we, I'm talking about the EU, you know, move into a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis relations, say, with Iran. In terms of Russia and the EU, where do you see that going? Well, I think, I mean, I'm actually thinking about this from a point of Ireland and the EU. I mean, I think, yeah. I think that's a very acute point. So both because of the threat to Russia, and I, I don't think Russia's, I mean, I'd be wrong about everything else around it, <laughs> but you know, is going to invade Latvia, but it's already engaging in the kind of cyber disruption and, and all <laughs> kinds of disruptive behavior uh, in the east of Europe generally, and, and if, insofar as it can in, in every state in Europe. I mean, I'm genuinely curious whether Ireland has escaped Russia's bot's attention, frankly, because, yeah. I mean, it's cheap for them to do, and, and I know whenever I talk on the radio, for example, about matters surrounding migration, a whole bunch of loony racists accounts on Twitter go nuts. But anyway, um, what so... What would be their interest here? Just well, push that, go on to the next step I think of they, it's, it's, they can do it and cheap, and I think they yeah. want to stoke populist parties and right. make countries less effective and, yeah. and stir anti-migration sentiment. And actually, I mean, and on that, is that one of the effects because of that, Because Trump? the anti-migration sentiment is an easy way just to stir things up generally yeah. and yeah. destabilise countries yeah. rather than the actual issue and, and someone said that to me about Trump, you know, in terms of... Um, is he making populism contagious simply by being there? That it's an aggravating factor in the populist trend? Well, I have to say, I, populism to me is not a problem. I mean, if you're, if you're responding to the needs of the people and you're, you're popular, I, I don't yeah. see why that's a problem. Or, I mean, yeah, yeah but some people think populism is just a euphemism for right wing. Yeah, well, uh, if it's a euphemism, that, I suppose yeah. that's, that's different. Um, I mean, look, it appeals to base instincts, and the, the anti migration thing definitely does, has obviously a huge impact on Brexit. We saw the interviews this week, I think, on RTE and Barnsley or wherever it was, like yeah. the. 
they were wondering why the immigrants hadn't all left by now, like after the vote. Like so, it's a, it stirs massively emotional uh, passions, and it is being used by you call them populists all over Europe just to get into power. I, I'm not sure that the, the interest is there, but the public are the public are very concerned about it, yeah. and it sets as the American public is, are very concerned is about what, it too. Is the saving grace for Europe that our parliamentary systems maybe just make it? less populism, less workable. So fine, we had that worrying um, general election result in, in the Czech Republic, <coughs> but at the end of the day, the people we worry about most are being forced into coalitions. Yeah, know. well, I, mean, I don't worry about democratic election results. If that's the people vote for, that's they vote for, as long as it's another election at some point, the people can get rid of them, that, that's yeah. fine. We, we've been very conscious of that in Fianna Fáil here. Like, we, we were very conscious, like, I mean, apart from promises we gave before the election, what we really did think was in the national interest not to have two centrist parties uh, going into coalition together or yeah. merging together, that there was an option for people. Yeah. Uh, and that that wouldn't lead to the rise of the, the demagoguery or the, the easy populism, um, the, the right wing or left wing populism that you described. So that, that was crucial for us. Uh, yeah, and funny, it's year, something so. a lot of people don't accept. They want to see the Fianna Fáil Fine Gael merger, but I but think that's a very legitimate. Want to succeed, want yeah. to see the merger, yeah. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Yeah, Ruth, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Question for a second, just opens um, hybrid yeah, I get what you say about um, Americans being irked um, and people, you know, talking about your politics. I think some of it's very facile and very misplaced. I mean, I know that from Americans who live in the U.S. citizens who live here, and they can be very upset by it sometimes, and, and it is misplaced often. We, we get angry at the same. But anyway, to explain it in some ways, we sentimentally can consider New York as the next parish west of the Aran Islands. We have an enormous section for the United States, and it really has a sentimental thing, it's a historical thing. That's part of the reason why we feel entitled and we're not entitled to, to talk about this point. My question to you is... It's um, so free to talk about it. Right, 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 but to, maybe to, to pontificate, or your, your point was more concrete, that our politicians are, are shooting themselves in the foot by using language that is alienating to a large... Particularly in the US. Yeah, no, that, that's a... I, I totally take the point. But my, my question to you is this. If we were to populate the imaginary BuzzFeed list of the top five international actors, be it intellectuals or countries that the U.S. thinks are the bomb, as in they think are fabulous, so they listen to. First of all, would that list have five on it? And secondly, who are they? Who does the U.S. actually listen to outside of the United States? Great question. Oh. Let me ask you to answer a slightly different question. What does the half of the United States that voted for Trump, who are those people they listen to? Because as far as the other half, I think they're in tune with most of this audience. You don't need to know who they're listening to. You listen to the same people, most of you, right? right. So let me, let me make a few suggestions to that other half, the half that I think many of you have never met. Uh, uh, they listen to Nigel Farage, all right? They listen to a British guy who now lives in the United States named Mark Stein, who used to have a column here in the Irish Times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they used to listen to the former Prime Minister of Australia, I'm very bad with names, I can't remember. Uh, Ron Howard? Howard, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, they, they used to listen to him. Right. Uh, two more. Uh, Netanyahu? It could be countries. Uh, yeah. It could be countries. It could be I like yeah. that one. Yeah. Net Netanyahu. Oh, Net yeah. Net 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 Netanyahu would be yeah. a good fourth. And prior to the election of Trump, uh, they used to listen to Vincente Fox from Mexico. <laughs> Trump, not so much anymore. <laughs> well, a couple of points I'd love to put to you. One of them is. Um, you know, we're talk somebody was saying uh, when Trump won, you know, a lot of these elections are won on the margin. And afterwards, the people that won look like geniuses and they swept the board. But actually, it was tiny. To, can the centre take back American politics with a few tweaks or changes? Or do you see the gulf between the current establishment and a more stable establishment being too wide, that, that this will be another four more years? Um, of Trump or just his administration? Just e at the, even the culture. So even yeah. if it's not him, it right. might be another yeah. right-wing figure from the Republican Party. Um, I think that is the case, in right. part because I think the Republican Party is afraid of Trump's base. Um, right. So I think that they're afraid of what would happen. I th and they have too much power. But on the, as I said earlier, right. I think 
what is as interesting is what's going to happen to the opposition, whether it's the Democratic Party or the Labour Party in the UK, yeah. or the, even, the, even though they're very tiny right now, the Lib Dems in, in the UK, because mm -hmm. um, they are coming up with ideas and they're mobilizing. But the opposition in the US is like nothing I've seen in my lifetime. I've never seen the left so, so on the streets mobilized. I've never seen such sort of virulent opposition to a political agenda. And is the Democratic Party willing to accept that left as being the basis of a fight back, or are they afraid of the left, and do they want to stick to the centre? I don't think, like what, what the UK has gone through, I don't think that the Democratic Party has much of a choice. Bernie Sanders, I mean, there's an argument that he could have beaten Trump because yeah. it was the 70,000 votes in states like Michigan and Wisconsin that lost yeah. Clinton in the election and they might have voted for somebody like yeah. Sanders. Not because he's a guy, because I think, I think he has the right. You I'm know, still he, carrying a torch for Joe Biden. I yeah. thought he could have been Trump. He, no, he might have. He <laughs> yeah. might have, because yeah. my, my dad. And I lot. blame Obama for that. Yeah, I so thought, do I. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so yeah do I. I should invite, yes, yeah. Uh, it's kind of connected to what you were just saying there, um, Shana, and a little bit for Seth as well. There was talk earlier of, of Steve Bannon being mentioned, and one of his things is, is really kind of, if you turn it into a culture war, uh, the Trump people will win. Yeah. I think Seth has been talking a lot about the kind of culture war aspect of it. Um, some of the kind of, so, you know, illegal versus undocumented. Like, I mean, that's not something that puts food in your, uh, puts money in your pocket, but that's the kind of thing that kind of gets people going. Um, so the question is kind of, uh, Bannon's interview after he left the White House, when he gave to Charlie Rose, essentially he said, if they put up, if the Democrats were to put up someone like a Sanders or someone like a West Virginia Democrat or I think Tulsi Gabbard in Hawaii and people like that, people who are more in tune with American values but are more left-wing economically, do the Democrats have to do something like that to actually be able to beat the, the populism um, and, or will they go back to kind of, you know, kind of corp, what, what are termed corporate Democrat sort of crap? Seth, stuff. do you want to maybe take that first? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll respond to you and I'll also respond in part to Shana because yeah. I think the questions are related. Yeah. You, you said that using the different language sort of gets people up or something yeah. close to that. Right? Yeah. There's a reason it gets people up, all right, because there is a large element in the United States that doesn't just see migration as this separate issue or illegal migration. They see it as this is core law and order. A country has borders. These people are breaking the law. You don't reward them for it, all right? It's, it's a question of whether you want a lawful society for many people. And, and, and to some extent, that, that takes me to what Shana just said. Shana said, the Republican Party, they're afraid of Trump's base. Well, she believes that. I would say Trump's base is the Republican Party. That's the former Republican Party you're talking about, Shana. All right? Those are the people who might own a few telephones or have a few storefronts, but the Republican Party are the people who actually win elections. That's the party. So, so the answer to your question is, in part, it, these aren't just words. All right? This is the way people are projecting forward their life and what sort of country they actually want. As Steve Bannon and Trump have tapped into that element, you might think that element is not really there or it's not really important, but they think it is important. And that's the America they want. Thomas, you want, I'll let you in. Thomas oh, yeah, wants to make a quick point. Just for a little observation. Yeah. At the Democratic yeah. Convention yeah. last year, yeah. um, we, we attended these conferences during the day and with all these retired politicians and current politicians and we met someone at the convention too. To me, they just exuded unbelievable wealth. They all just mm -hmm. looked really, really rich. And, you know, they just, uh, I just said, how are these people relating to ordinary, ordinary voters across mm -hmm. America? And it really struck me. I said, God, that's a, will that work? Is that the way politics is going? I mean, you give out about retired politicians here in the pensions. The retired politicians over there are, some, in some cases, billionaires yeah. um, through their political connections. So they're so far removed <coughs> from ordinary life, I think, and it's something the Democrats will have to work on, I think. Um, I, th I think that's an excellent point. Yes. In fact, you have to, these days you have to be a billionaire to be a politician, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, the wealth of politicians is, is quite amazing. So. Um, uh, do, have you read Angela Nagel's book yet on Kill All Normies and yeah, no. about the culture wars? Okay, everybody needs to read this book, yeah. and I won't bore you with the details, but it's really about how the culture was ahead of the politics, and it was the winning of the culture wars that fed into the political situation that we have now. And until you know the liberals and the left, and liberals is often used as a pejorative term these days, can get back in there and fight the culture wars and win again, this is what we've got. Look, I'll have one more. One, would you want right, one, just make one, one point? Really yeah. quickly, I've yeah. got a sort of optimistic yeah. and a pessimistic. Spin okay, on great. Some of this. Sounds good. One is yeah. the cent the op pessimistic one is the center has been dragged so far to the right by the Republican Party's expunging moderates from its party. So when we see Corker and Jeff Flake and uh, John McCain, you know, 
being the moderates who are standing up to the president, yeah. right? I mean, they were the right, you know, before the Tea Party deselected people like Dick Luger, you know, and this is, so this is the culmination of a long process by which the Republican Party has become the Tea Party. Um, and you saw that in the, the primaries, it was just basically the internal debates of the Tea Party. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the optimistic version is, I think, and this applies to the Republican Party maybe as much as, as the Democratic Party maybe, is that eventually, you know, identity politics are not going to be able to get you, uh, and cultural wars are mm -hmm. not going to eventually get you crucial things you want. And that's why Obamacare has shown itself to be so resilient, and why universal single-payer healthcare is now being thought by Democrats who previously would never have gone anywhere near it. And I think it's just that people's livelihoods are so complicated by crucial issues like healthcare that people are now starting to think in terms of more creative and, and frankly, more ideological and less identity-based politics on the left and I think probably on the right. And maybe we will see a change from politics as normal which might have some creative solutions. So what are really big problems for Americans? I mean, most people in this room will have not have paid for American health insurance. Um, I have, it's like a second mortgage. Mm -hmm. and, and some people are on policies with an $8,000 deductible, right? <laughs> you know, so you have to consume $8,000 worth of healthcare before you get to, uh, and that costs them $22,000 a year. Yeah. This is hitting people, whether they're in the Republican Party or not, and, and, and hopefully the United States can come together to, to, to do something about it.